broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good evening. Uh, uh, this is Tao Li. Uh, um, here, you know, glad to be here with you folks tonight. Uh, we're going to do our secrets of the USMLE, uh, uh, the webinar that will teach you how to dissect any question on test day. So uh, welcome. Hope, hope this, uh, this is helpful for you folks. Uh, so um, with me is my co-presenter, uh, Daniel Griffin. Uh, uh, Daniel, will you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, so hey, Dan Griffin here. Um, you know, currently a Poem Critical Care Fellow at University of Missouri at Kansas City. Um, I've been working with First Aid now for two or three years, uh, doing some of the express videos and currently serving as the editor. Um, you know, real interest in, you know, question, question approach, stuff like that. So and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Great. We also have some wonderful panelists that will be uh, answering questions, uh, you know, as you type them in tonight. So you might notice that if you're on a PC or a Mac, uh, there's a question panel that's probably, you know, potentially on the right side of your screen. Uh, and there's a question panel where you can, you know, ask, uh, uh, you know, questions. We'll try to do our best to answer them tonight. Uh, so there's a couple of folks that are doing that. So, uh, uh, Manover, you want to introduce yourself? Manover, you there? Um, okay, maybe Manover is on mute. Uh, how about Sean? Sean, you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Great, Sean, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi guys, my name is Sean Nanji. Um, I originally started KISS Prep a while ago, been working with First Aid for some time. Looking forward to working with them more and to this webinar. I'm sure it's going to be really helpful for all of your students. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, Manover, you back. Hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm Manover Diol. I've been uh, with RX for about four years now. I'm the senior editor on the Step Two product, and I also manage the faculty council. And I'm happy to be here and answer any questions you may have. Great. We also have some other folks, uh, Jeff Downing, Louise, who are going to answer other questions in the background as well too. So lots of folks out there that'll try to help help you have a great, uh, uh, you know, webinar experience tonight. Uh, and so again, if you have questions, you know, feel free to put them into the Q&A box. You know, we'll, we'll we'll try to do our best we can. Sometimes if questions are too specific, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, it's challenging to uh, uh, to provide those types of answers. Like, you know, hey, how do I prep? You know, hey, hey how do I specifically prepare for my situation? Um, and uh, you know, the 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 other thing that uh, I'll just kind of uh, uh, say is that you know, we. We generally uh, can't do too much about giving product recommendations just because there's so many things out there and so forth. But if you uh, go to uh, uh, firstdayteam.com, you can look at our, 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 our resource recommendations for books, uh, website, QBanks, and so forth. So uh, that, that should hopefully answer a bunch of your questions uh, you know, um, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, this evening. So again, my name is Tal Lee, uh, and just a little bit about me. Uh, I am the senior editor for First Aid. Uh, as many of you do know, and also the uh, editor and founder for USLRX, uh, you know, the, the question bank series and uh, video series and digital flashcard series. Um, I'm also a, an educator and a clinician at the University of Florida where I lead the uh, section of allergy and biology. All right, so we'll get going and just I'll just ask everybody to put themselves on mute. We'll try to keep the lines pretty quiet uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know, look, look, Look forward to helping you guys dissect uh, USMLE style questions. All right, so let's get going. Uh, well, uh, well, the first thing I do want to see, uh, find out is I, I do want to find out who's who's on the call tonight. Uh, there's a there's a bunch of you folks, and uh, usually it's a mixed crowd, but I want to know what type of students we have out there. So I'm going to uh, launch a poll question, and yeah, uh, you should be getting the poll question any moment now. It's really asking you who you are, and so you, know, you should uh, you should be seeing the prompt. And uh, please, uh, you know, uh, choose uh, a response, and then we'll uh, we'll wait a couple of we'll give wait a couple of seconds to uh, you know get some feedback, and then we'll share it with the the rest of the group. All right, so I'm seeing about 30% um, of you folks uh, responding. Uh, we'll uh, we'll give it a couple more seconds. I'll wait till we get maybe two thirds response. Okay, good. Uh, looks like we've got, uh, uh, you know, 75% response. So I'm going to share that. 
So what you see here is uh, we got quite a few folks who are uh, you know IMG, so international medical graduates. Uh, half uh, you know uh, you know the majority of the IMGs are from outside the United States. A quarter are from inside the United States. We also have a quarter of the roughly a quarter of the group are are, are uh, uh, met, U.S. med students. So welcome everybody. So it's a nice spread of folks from all over the place and perhaps even uh, internationally as well too outside the United States. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove that poll. And so we're going to get into the presentation. So you know, over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, we're going to talk about you know, the, the USMLE, the question types, and we're going to talk about a little bit about the anatomy of a board style question and what you need to know to dissect these questions. And that's where Daniel is going to jump in because he's been doing that for a long time. And then we will actually go through some question dissections. Uh, you know, and you know, and work you through a couple of examples. Uh, you know, and uh, then give you some advice at the very towards the end. Try to sum it up for you folks. Uh, and for those folks who do stay to the end, uh, there is a raffle. We will be raffling off, uh, uh, you know, uh, a couple of subscriptions to our 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 our, our flagship resource, which is US Linear RX, uh, RX 360, which is the combination of our question banks, our videos, and our digital flashcards. Uh, but we also have a special offer for folks as well, too, just for attending the webinar. So hang on and find out what it is. And then at the very end, we'll also hopefully uh, have some time for some open Q&A where, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll ask uh, Sean and Maniver to kind of, you know, you know, tell us what kind of thematic questions they're seeing, you know, and then we'll try to address it as a group. All right. Fantastic. So, um, all right, let's go on to the next slide. All right, so the, the US only has really only one type of question. It's called a one best answer type question. So that means you'll get a, you know, a, a, a case vignette, a question, and then multiple distractors. And you have to choose, obviously, the, uh, you know, the, the, the most appropriate answer. You'll, you have to understand that uh, some of the question answers can be partially right. So you're always looking for the answer that is the most right. So I know that sounds a little confusing. Uh, but there is a spectrum of questions that uh, is, um, you know, there's a spectrum of answers that are that are that go from absolutely wrong to almost the, the most right. All right. Now, uh, about 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 15, 20 percent of the questions will have, you know, uh, images, diagrams and so forth. And uh, 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 and a couple will have multimedia, uh, you know, uh, with regards to uh, clinical vignettes. And, um, you know, almost all of the exam is clinical vignettes, you know, about, you know, 80 plus percent of the exam. And, you know, I would say the majority of the questions have multi-step reasoning. What does that mean? That means that you have integrated concepts uh, that they try to pull together that's, you know, tied, that's thematically tied to the clinical presentation or related some way. And that you have to go through these multiple steps to really be able to uh, solve the, uh, uh, so, so, so the, uh, the, the question. So, you know, here's an example of a two-step question here. 32-year-old Caucasian woman uh, presents, uh, you know, to your clinic, well, let me see, uh, presents to the clinic with a five-day history of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, double vision and uh, ptosis, uh, which is bilateral. And uh, then the question may ask, what is the most appropriate diagnostic test? And what you'll realize is that there are two steps, as I mentioned to this question. The first thing that you have to solve is, you know, what is this case? What is what's going on in this clinical vignette here? Uh, what's the diagnosis? So uh, notice is a, you know, a Caucasian woman, fairly young. Uh, she's got uh, the double vision and the bilateral is symmetric. And so you know, in this clinical scenario, it's most likely going to be myasthenia gravis. You could argue for, um, uh, you know, multiple sclerosis, but that tends to have, you know, unilateral findings or asymmetrical findings. Okay. Uh, so once you establish that the probable diagnosis is is, uh, is myasthenia gravis, then you have to think, well, what is the most appropriate diagnostic test? So that's the you know uh, the the second question here, you know, uh, or uh, that's the, the the second step. So what's the most di uh, appropriate diagnostic test? And in this particular case, this is going to be uh, in, you know in anti acetylcholinesterase antibodies. Uh, um, you know, so the assay for that. You know, uh, you know, it, classically, it's it 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 was uh, edrophonium uh, or the Tenslon test, which uh, which is a short-acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. 
Uh, but you know that that test is slowly going away, at least in the U.S., and it's being replaced by uh, you know antibody assays like the anti-acetylcholinesterase uh, antibodies. Uh, so so there you go. That's an example of a, a two-step question, and um, you know in, in terms of how you might want to approach the, uh, uh, the the test. So when you dissect a question, as you just saw there, you are going to try to parse out the clinical vignette. You have to identify the lead in, what, which is what is the question? What is it, what is it they're trying to ask you to do? And Daniel is going to go through, uh, go through that uh, you know, uh, technique in a lot more detail. Uh, you need to be able to pull out the cardinal signs and, and symptoms uh, that are presented in the clinical vignette. Uh, and you, you're going to use that to help uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, go through their choices and figure out what is the most likely diagnosis. Uh, and then if it's a multi-step question, then what, you know, uh, you know, what's, what's potentially tied to that case presentation that will ultimately lead you to the answer. All right. So at this point, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Daniel to go a little deeper into the anatomy of a US Lee style question. Daniel, you there? Yeah. All right. So when you look at a US Lee style question, um, you know, kind of talk about the question anatomy or how the question is formatted. Um, each question has a stem, a lead in, a key, which is just the correct answer, and then the distractors, which are the wrong answers. So if we were to look at a question itself, can we I don't, advance the slide? There we go. If we were to look at a question itself and we were to say, you know, what in this question here, which is the stem, which is the lead in, where's the key, and where are the distractors? Um, if we were to read it and go through it, the stem itself is just the, the body or the paragraph that's presented in front of, you know, the final line, which is the question, um, and that's the lead-in. So, so the stem would be that part right there that's just highlighted, um, followed by the lead-in, and then, you know, you have your answer choices, which in this case, the key is going to be platelet count, um, and the distractors are going to be all the other related answers. Uh, and if we, uh, we kind of got it color-coded for you um, to kind of, there we go. So this kind of helps also further illustrate, you know, where the stem is, where the lead in is, um, your key as well as your distractors. So kind of when you're looking at this, what do you need to be looking for? Um, so first off is the, the lead in itself. And that's just the question that they're going to ask you. And that can come in many different forms um, from, you know, what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the nest Beck? Sorry. What is the best net initial diagnostic test? Kind of we talked about earlier. Um, what's the best initial treatment? What's the most accurate diagnostic test? What's the most appropriate next step in management? Um, what's the mechanism of action? Um, you know, what physical exam findings or lab findings might you see? Um, and just being familiar with all the different types of questions that can be asked in related to, you know, any said disease um, can really help you kind of hone in on how you need to approach these questions. Um, that when we look at the, you know, the answer choices themselves, we can also see that you have a key and then you have distractors. I know sometimes um, people like to think that, you know, the distractor, the distracting parts are within the stem, um, but the distractors are classically just the, the wrong answers um, when you look at just your answer choices. And, you know, often, you know, if, if you're given images or you're giving lab findings and those don't seem to correlate with what you're, you know, seeing down in there in the answer choices, um, you know, my suggestion to you would be to look at the stem um, and answer your question based off the stem is that's the most important and you know labs and images those are kind of ancillary tests and not quite as important in making your decision when you're picking the answer. First thing uh, uh, just real quick I want to show you how kind of I approach board style questions um, and this is once again it doesn't matter which approach you use um, I just suggest that you have approach. Um, and the reason I suggest you have an approach is so that you do it the same way every single time. Um, and, you know, you, you get good at that process, kind of like reading a chest x-ray. You've ever seen like the ABCDs of reading a chest x-ray or the one, two, threes or, you know, any of those type things. How, how you go through that process from beginning to end and you get very good at the way you do it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show everybody how I approach questions. And usually what I do is I start with the lead in, which is the question itself again. And I, I read that just to kind of get a sense of where I am, what the question is going to be asking me, how I want to approach it, you know, on my own or myself. Um, the next thing I look at is the answer choices. Um, this is kind of a, a point of controversy. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like to look at the answer choices. 
Um, all of the questions on the USMLE can be answered by covering up the answer choices. Um, and that's kind of how they're written. They're written with that frame in mind um, that you could potentially, it could be a fill in the blank test. Um, but I look at the answer choices because I like to kind of guide my thoughts as to when I'm reading what I'm looking for within the STEM because the STEM can be very wordy. As you know, it can be five to six to seven sentences with labs. And I wanna know what I'm looking for what distinguishing characteristics will help me pick answer choice A versus answer choice C or something like that. The next I'll do is read the question, which uh, that's just the stem itself. Um, I'll read through that once again, keeping in mind my answer choices below, keeping in mind um, the lead in, which is just the question itself. Um, then I have here eliminate the wrong choices. And it's not per se eliminate wrong choices. It's really probably better worded to say, give a reason as to why you're not picking A, B, C, and then why you were picking D, and then why you were not picking E. So just have a reason, have an explanation. It can even be faulty logic here. But if you're going as far to say, you know, I'm not picking A because of X, Y, or Z, that really helps you know you solidify your knowledge base, how far your knowledge base is. And then if you realize, hey, I, I can't give a reason why I'm not picking A, then you know where you need to go study, where you need to go read, where you need to go learn more. Um, then you know, I suggest that you pick an answer. Um, and once again, you're picking the best answer, like Dr. Lee said, you know, there's multiple correct answers on kind of a spectrum. Um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, you want to pick the most correct answer, which is sometimes difficult to, to figure out. And then my suggestion is, is you move on. Um, and the reason I have this here is, you know, once you've established a process or a format in which you go through a board style question, whenever you get to the end of that format or that, you know, thought process or that logic, um, Usually spending two more minutes, three more minutes staring at the question is not going to improve um, how you, you do in the end. Um, so, so my suggestion here is, you know, you've gone through your process, you have done the best you can, you've applied every, you know, potential way you know how to look at the question to the question that's been given. You're going to pick an answer, you're going to move on, you're going to attack the next question with the same, you know, um, bend and bigger that you attach to uh, the, attack the last question so that you, you can you know, hopefully do well on all questions and not leave some out at the end um, and make sure you get to every question. So, and now I kind of want to give you an example, but also showing you again how I would go through the question. So here's, here's the, um, the, the, the lead-in. And so I read the lead-in. Which of the following drugs is most likely responsible for the adverse effects he is experiencing? So we're going to be looking at an adverse effect question. So then I would look at the, um, uh, the answer choices themselves. So first off, I see cyclophosphamide. And once again, we're thinking about adverse effects. So the adverse effects of cyclophosphamide, um, you know, if we think about what that would be, that would be hemorrhagic cystitis. So hemorrhagic cystitis is that classic adverse effect of cyclophosphamide. Thinking a little further, how would we treat that? You know, mesna or IV fluids would be a great, you know, potential follow-up question to this question. And then, you know, what would I expect the question to read or the question to talk about if I really was going to pick cyclophosphamide as the cause of hemorrhagic cystitis, well, maybe it's a person with a vasculitity or GPA, or which is, you know, granulomatosis with polyangiitis or lupus or some form of malignancy. So you know, that's kind of what I'd be thinking or what I'd be looking for within the STEM if I was going to pick choice A. Um, for choice B, we have doxyrubicin, you know, the classic adverse effect here is just a cardiotoxicity, causes a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, for your glucocorticoids, you know, the classic adverse effects here are, you know, weight gain, diabetes or elevated blood sugars, osteoporosis, um, thinning hair, thinning skin, you know, easy bruising, and then, you know, bad vision, you know, cloudy vision, um, or, uh, you know, last but not least, the, you know, just uh, cataracts, cataracts. There we go. Sorry. Sorry, I got stuck there. Um, so for methotrexate, you know, when I'm looking at that, you know, what would I be expecting that adverse event to be? Maybe some anemia or pulmonary fibrosis, you know, can cause you know, pancytopenia, um, and then vincristin or vinblastin, either one of those, I would be looking for, you know, peripheral neuropathy is kind of what, what the question stem would be talking about. So keeping all of that in mind, you know, cyclophosphamide, the hemorrhagic cystitis, doxyrubicin, the cardiomyopathy, glucocorticoids, the diabetes, the weak bones, the thin skin, uh, hairs falling out, bad vision, um, methotrexate, maybe anemia or pulmonary fibrosis, vincristin, um, the peripheral neuropathy, I would then go in and read the question itself. Okay, and now going through this question, we have a five-year-old boy that's brought to the pediatrician because he's been complaining of fatigue and headaches for several weeks. On exam, he has 
in large lymph nodes, and the CBC reveals a white blood cell count of 30,000 with some blast on peripheral smear. He's sent for a bone marrow biopsy. The bone marrow biopsy reveals large lymphoblasts with prominent nucleoli and light blue cytoplasm, and the patient is diagnosed with acute lymphoid leukemia, or ALL. Um, he's treated with high-dose high glucocorticoids, intravenous, intra, and intravenous and intrathecal fecal methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, doxyrubicin, and vincristin. Well into his treatment course, he begins to complain of difficulty with vision and explains that his vision is cloudy. Um, so from here, I would look at my answer choices. I would you know, think through that little thought process that I've already gone through and then pick my choice. And I think we can toss up the poll maybe now for everybody to answer this question. That's right. So let's go ahead and, uh, um, you know, you know you, you, you're, you're, you're very fortunate. Daniel's kind of walking you through this, so you've had a chance to really think about this. I'm going to go up, open up uh, the, the poll, and uh, please pick an answer. Think A, B, C, D, E. Give you guys a couple of seconds to grab it, and then once you've grabbed it, I'm going to go ahead and open the poll. So I'll just wait a couple of seconds, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get going. All right, hopefully everybody's got an answer. So let's go ahead and uh, submit that answer. So I'm going to launch the question poll right now. Go ahead and uh, 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 go ahead and stick in an answer. We'll wait a couple more seconds. I think only about 20 folks, 20% 20 of the folks have answered. We'll wait a little longer. About half the folks have answered. Looks like it's take, just taking a little while for the answers to come in. All right, looks like we've got, uh, you know, you know, at least 75% of the folks have answered. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, close the poll. And all right, and I'm going to share. And uh, looks like you guys are voting for glucocorticoids. Some of you guys are thinking methotrexate and vincristine, but it looks like the, the bulk of the votes are for glucocorticoids. So let's Let's see what the answer is. The answer is, see, glucocorticoids, so you guys have it. All right, back well, to you, Dan. Could you, could you bring back the, I can still see the, the poll question. Oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Great, so the answer is glucocorticoids, and could we go into back to the question or just advance to the next slide? Yep. All right, so when we're looking at this question, um, you know, we're looking once again for adverse effects, um, and we're going to try to comb the question itself for the adverse effects. Um, you know, he's got fatigue and a headache, which is, you know, very nonspecific, you know, hard to relate that to potentially anything. Um, and then, you know, after the fatigue and headache, he gets diagnosed with ALL, um, and then he is started on treatment. So if we kind of lay out the appropriate timeline, the fatigue and headache potentially couldn't even contribute to, um, you know, our, our adverse effect of one of our medications here. And then it says, well, into his treatment course, he begins to complain um, uh, of difficulty with his vision and states his vision is cloudy. And that's kind of the classic cataracts, um, you know, statement there. So, and glucocorticoids are known to cause cataracts. Um, once again, cyclophosphamide causing that hemorrhagic cystitis, you'd be looking for more, you know, bloody urine or something like that. Um, for doxyrubicin and the cardiomyopathy, maybe some shortness of breath, orthopnea, proxismal nocturnal dyspnea, um, lower extremity edema. So none of those things were mentioned, so you know that one can be um, ruled out. Um, for methotrexate, we'd be looking for you know maybe anemia or pulmonary fibrosis. You know with anemia, he does have fatigue, um, but once again, I think that was before treatment was started. So maybe you know uh, more fatigue afterward or following platelet counts. Or following blood counts or following white counts, um, something along those lines. Also, um, you know, pulmonary fibrosis is a uh, something that can be caused by methotrexate. That would be, you know, shortness of breath, hypoxia, or maybe dry Velcro crackles at the bilateral bases, which is just, you know, the 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 sound you get when you rub your hair together. Um, whenever you're listening on, you know, auscultating on physical exam. And then Vin Kristen, we're looking for peripheral neuropathy. I don't give anything, you know, no numbness, no tingling, no burning in his hands, his feet. Um, so that's unlikely to be the answer. So, so C is going to be the correct answer here. Um, 
to me, this question is very similar in, to how questions about, um, let's see, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are asked. And if you could kind of pan over or hit next. Um, and here you can see, you know, for Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's treated with ABVD, um, which is the adriamycin, the bleomycin, um, the venblastin, and the dicarbazine. And once again, the doxyrobicin is the adriamycin that causes a cardiotoxicity. Um, your bleomycin causes pulmonary fibrosis. Your venblastin, also your venchristin, um, causes peripheral neuropathy. So you're going to be looking for, you know, that burning in your hands and your feet, um, those type things, you know, numbness and tingling, you know, hurts to stand, those type things. Dicarbazine, um, it can lower your blood count, so cause a pain cytopenia as well as causes really bad nausea. Um, and then if we look at the treatment for, you know, your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so that's going to be your RCHOP treatment, which is, you know, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, um, adriamycin again, or a form of donorubicin, which is, you know, um, you know, kind of in that same class as doxyrubicin, oncovorin or vincristin, and then prednisone. Um, rituximab, if you remember, is that monoclonal antibody against CD20, which, you know, results in lowering B cells, so it attacks B cells, um, so it kind of depletes you of your B cells, which, remember, your B cells fight infection, um, so you're at increased risk of infections on this medicine. Um, cyclophosphamide, again, is that hemorrhagic cystitis. You know, what are you looking for? You know, blood on your urine or, you know, red blood cells on a UA. Um, uh, then, you know, the donorubicin or doxyrubicin, once again, the cardiotoxicity, dilated cardio um, cardiomyopathies, your drug-induced cardiomyopathies there, the vincristin or vinblastin, again, the peripheral neuropathy, as we already spoke of, and then the prednisone, same as the glucocorticoids, your know, weight gain, elevated blood sugars, osteoporosis, thinning of the hair, thinning of the skin, um, and then, you know, your cataracts, kind of as we've already talked about. So, and we can move on to the next question. All right, so we'll just hop right into this one. Um, so we're just going to do this one as, as most folks do, just top to bottom, read it, um, and pick an answer at the end, and then we'll kind of discuss it. So here we have a 42-year-old man that presents the local crisis center requesting alcohol de detoxification. Um, he has a 20-year history of heavy drinking, with his longest period of abstinence being four months. His last drink was two nights ago, and he now complains of discomfort and anxiety. Physical exam reveals coarse tremors, facial flushing, flushing palmar erythema, spider angiomas, as well as a blood pressure of 145 over 95, a pulse of 115, and a temperature of 38.3 degrees Celsius or 100.9 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And the question is, which of the following drugs is the best initial treatment of this patient's condition? So we're looking for a treatment of the condition, and we have um, chlorodiase epoxide, um, dasulfiram, naltrexone, lorazepam, and then thiamine. Um, and those are going to be, you know, which is the best initial treatment for this patient's current diagnosis. So once again, kind of a two-step reasoning here. You have to make the diagnosis, then you have to pick the most appropriate treatment. And um, if we can. All right, so uh, why don't we uh, why don't we give you guys a you know a 15 seconds to think about this question and the most appropriate answer, and then uh, I'll I'll open up the poll. Okay, I hope everybody's got an answer. So let's go ahead and uh, open up the poll. Uh, you know, go ahead and give us an answer. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll keep this open for about 20 seconds. All right, it looks like about 30 folks have answered. Half of you folks have answered. I'm going to wait a couple more seconds. Going to try to get to about two thirds of the, the the crowd. All right, looks like uh, roughly seventy folks, seven percent of the folks have answered. So let's go on and uh, close the poll and share the results. And we 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 see a spread of answers here. So the leading answer is uh, dilorazepam, uh, but close second is thiamine, and, and there's quite a few folks who think. A disulfiram and chlorodizoxapide uh, as, as well too, uh, and a few for a naltrexone. So you know this is spread. So this is definitely uh, I think uh, you know uh, vexing you folks. So let's uh, go ahead and hide the poll, and then uh, get back to the presentation. 
And the answer is lorazepam, D. So, uh, so, uh, so about 30 folks got it. All right. All right. So lorazepam is the answer here. Um, and where, where I feel like this question gets a little tricky um, is if you once again look at the Ligledian itself, it's going to be asking for which of the following drugs is the best initial treatment of this patient's condition. It doesn't ask us to try to prevent anything. Um, it asks us to treat a current illness or current problem um, where, you know, a lot of people kind of got hung up is on thiamine. So, you know, thiamine, you're trying to prevent that Wernicke's encephalopathy. But once again, that's a trying to prevent um, the future sequela of, you know, basically not getting enough thiamine. Um, but we're not at best initially treating anything. So almost, um, you know, kind of understanding exactly what they're asking there, knowing how to uh, approach the question from that end is, you know, understanding the stem and then appropriately picking the answer based off the stem. Um, and, you know, that, that can kind of lead to some, some confusion there. If we go through the individual answer choices themselves, the chlordiazepine epoxide, you know, that is, a, that is an oral medication. It is a benzodiazepine. Um, but once again, an oral medication would not be appropriate for someone that's going through acute alcohol withdrawals. Um, so how do we know he's going through acute alcohol withdrawal? Well, if you read, you know, reading the stem, um, he's got a long drinking history as well as he's presenting with signs and symptoms of um, autonomic instability with, you know, hypertension, elevated heart rate, um, fevers. Um, and then he even has signs and symptoms of, you know, his chronic alcohol abuse and maybe some liver injury with the spider angiomatas, the palmar erythema, the facial flushing. And then the coarse tremors would also kind of go along with the ongoing current, you know, alcohol withdrawal that's taking place. And, you know, also in the setting of his last drink being two nights ago. Um, so, yes, and then the anxiety and discomfort, you know, the, the um, you know, kind of feeling, feeling on edge. Um, all that goes along with, you know, this being an, an acute issue, not something that we need to try to treat chronically with a PO medicine, but something we need to give more of a, an, an immediate acting medicine, which would be the lorazepam, which can be given IV. Um, disulfiram, you know, disulfiram is, you know, the, the medicine that inhibits the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And once again, it's, it's used to prevent alcohol abuse. Um, not typically so much anymore because it causes a lot of side effects, um, you know, but it makes you, you know, makes you sick if you do drink. Um, but uh, that's kind of its purpose. Once again, this is not someone that we're trying to prevent alcohol abuse. We're trying to prevent current symptoms because um, he's, once again, actively going through withdrawals. Um, this potentially could be considered as a okay option. I feel like it's not the best option, even if the question were written um, as someone that wanted alcohol detoxification and had been abstinent for, you know, months and had gotten through the acute phase um, and wanted a medicine to try to decrease, you know, his cravings. Um, if we, if that were how the question were written, now Trexone would actually be the best answer there. Because um, now Trexone is used for both opioid as well as um, alcohol dependence um, and can be, you know, good in that scenario. So that if the question were written as though, you know, a 42 year old man coming into a local crisis center for alcohol detoxification, his vital signs were currently normal. He had no anxiety, no discomfort, but he just had, you know, the desire to drink again. And he hasn't drank in, you know, several weeks. He has no active signs of sim symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, um, but would like to try a medicine to decrease his desire to drink. Now, now Trexone would be the right answer there. Um, once again, for lorazepam, it's, it can be given PO or IV as a benzodiazepine. Um, and that's going to be our correct answer here. It's going to treat his, you know, acute alcohol withdrawal, which is going on currently. And then the thiamine, once again, um, kind of understanding what the question is asking, you know, that there, we're not trying to prevent, you know, warning keys here. We're trying to treat something acutely. So it's a best initial management. Um, the thiamine would be given. It's not a, a, a medicine this person wouldn't get, but it's not the best answer here. Um, looking at our answer choices in his current symptoms. All right, so we'll just hop right into this next question. Um, it's a little longer, but uh, I feel like it's a good question and we'll get a lot out of it. So this is a 60-year-old man that works as a correctional officer and he comes to his primary care provider because of a non-productive cough, difficulty breathing, and progressive fatigue over the last two weeks. Um, he's noticed about a 10 pound or 4.5 kilogram unintentional weight loss, and which has possibly happened within that same time frame. Um, on evaluation today, his temperature is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 
His blood pressure is 132 over 78. His pulse is 85. His respiratory rate is 16. And his SpO2 is 95% over there. Physical exam is unremarkable. Uh, the patient has a one pack here, one pack per day, history of uh, cigarette smoking for the past 30 years. Um, he takes lisinopril and simvastatin for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And he denies any previous surgeries or hospitalizations. Uh, physical exam, uh, sorry, phys the physician orders a chest x-ray um, and it shows a left hilar mass with mediastinal adenopathy. A biopsy uh, is performed and the results are shown below. And the question here, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And we have A, sarcoidosis. We have B, large cell carcinoma. We have C, mycobacterium tuberculosis. We have D, squamous cell carcinoma. And we have E, small cell carcinoma. All right, very good. So uh, uh, since this is a pretty big stem, I'll, I'll give you guys a little extra time to take a look. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, take a read through, take a look at the slide, and then uh, lock in on an answer and I'll, uh, I'll pop up a poll. All right, I hope everybody has an answer, so just go ahead and pick one. All right, looks like about 20% uh, have answered. All right, it's climbing. Looks like uh, we're close to half the folks have answered. So uh, keep it coming, keep it coming. Is it A, sarcoidosis, B, large cell carcinoma, C, mycobacteria? D, squamous cell carcinoma, or E, small cell carcinoma. All right, looks like uh, three quarters of you folks have answered, so I think that's enough of a sample. So I am going to uh, close the poll. All right, share the results. Half of you folks are saying small cell carcinoma, so that is the, that's the majority. Uh, but a fair number of all folks are also thinking about squamous cell carcinoma, and a small scattering is thinking sarcoidosis and uh, TB. So let's get back to the presentation. So I'll drop the poll, get back to here. And let's go to the answer. And the answer is small cell carcinoma. So, so, so the crowd has it. So let's go back to our case. And uh, Daniel, why don't you walk us through this again? All right. So here, once again, we have the answer, which is small cell carcinoma. And, you know, how did we arrive at that, that answer? Well, if you, you look at the stem itself, um, you know, and kind of ask yourself, you know, do do I need all the information within the stem, or I, do I need this image? Is this image something that, that I have to have to answer this question? Um, what you would end up coming up with is you do need the image. Um, the image is needed to answer this question. So if you read through the question itself, we have, you know, our 60-year-old guy. He's coming in with this non-productive cough, the difficulty breathing, progressive fatigue, some weight loss, um, vital signs, physical exams, pretty normal. He's got a smoking history. Um, and then we have, you know, the chest x-ray, which shows the left hilar mass and some mediastinal lymphadenopathy. So if we have that um, kind of stem, what, what would that potentially apply to? Well, for sarcoidosis, you know, what would we kind of expect? Well, usually it's a little younger patient, um, and typically on, you know, the board exams in the U.S., they're African-American um, patients, um, usually on the younger side, somewhere in their 20s to 40s. Um, they talk about bihylar lymphadenopathy, so you could potentially see a hilar mass in that patient, um, and they present potentially with, you know, fever, night sweats, fatigue, um, you know, the shortness of breath. They can also have some weight loss, some cough, um, but usually they also give you a few other symptoms like potential hypercalcemia, you know, from the overactive granulomas, um, maybe some erythema nodosum on their shins, um, or maybe like an enlarged parotid gland. Um, and we're not seeing any of those, those type factors. And we, you know, as a group seem to potentially rule out um, sarcoidosis fairly well. Look at the large cell cancer, you know, once again, we're looking for a smoker with some weight loss, which we do have that. Um, once again, we have our image as well as we have, you know, just classically for board speaking, a centrally located mass um, as opposed to a peripherally located mass um, with the, the, high, the left hilar mass there. So that's kind of centrally located. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, for the mycobacterium tuberculosis, you know, kind of what would we be looking for within the question stem itself? You know, maybe some fever, some chills, some night sweats again, again, some weight loss, but homoptysis would be another big one. You can have homoptysis within, you know, the setting of cancer. Um, but once again, you know, it's uh, kind of 
kind of usually classically speaking, hemoptysis is presented with your, your TB cases. Um, also, you'd have a high-risk patient, which once again, for your USMLE exam, that's going to be either your immigrants, um, patients that are homeless, or patients that are from prison. Um, so those are kind of some of the things to be looking out for there. For your squamous cell carcinoma, it could read exactly as this stem has read, been written, um, with you know it being that left hilar mass, which you know once again squamous cell carcinoma and small cell carcinoma are usually your centrally located cancers, um, meaning that they're located towards your mediastinum. Um, so once again, you need to be able to look at this picture and say, what do I see here? Which you know these small blue cells on H and E stain, um, and know that that is small cell cancer as opposed to squamous cell cancer. A few other things the question could have presented is, you know, maybe some elevated calciums in the setting of your squamous cell carcinoma due to the PTHRP that's um, sometimes released. And for your small cell um, carcinoma, they could potentially um, talk about some hyponatremia, um, which can, you know, remember small cell carcinoma can lead to an SIADH type picture, um, which is um, commonly seen. So once again, like we said, we need the image here to answer this question. So what if the image looks a little different? Um, what if it looks something like this? Um, what would the answer be? So here, what do you see on this picture? So our last picture we saw, you know, the small blue cells on HME stain. Here we see what is actually a keratin pearl. Um, so this is, you know, what we're looking at here, a keratin pearl. And what are keratin pearls classically seen in? Well, they're classically seen in squamous cell cancer. So this question right here could be written exactly the same, and they just changed your image and the answer would have changed. So this could have easily been two different questions um, on a question stem, on a QBank, um, on the USMLE itself. So just realize that very minor changes in questions can lead to completely different answers. Um, so once again, you know, the small blue cells would have been the small cell carcinoma. Um, this keratin pearl that we're seeing there um, would have been the squamous cell carcinoma. And then what if the image looked something like this? What do you see here? Um, this is actually uh, a non-caseating granuloma with multinucleated giant cells. So if I told you that, I, what I will tell you is it would have been a little odd for sarcoidosis to read as this previous question has, but it can read that way. Um, it can present just like cancer. Um, I know, I know I've seen many of patients with sarcoidosis that we thought had cancer and it ended up just being sarcoid. Um, but if you got this, this stem or this vignette, um, and then we're given this image to answer your questions. Um, you know, once again, classic in a younger patient with bihyalur lymphadenopathy, maybe it's not, not so much weight loss and a few more, you know, B-type symptoms with fever and night sweat, something like that. Um, once again, just realizing that, you know, one stem can lead to many different answer choices if given, you know, the appropriate images, the appropriate other findings um, that you would kind of expect to see there. So that's going to kind of wrap up this question. All right, fantastic. Go to our fourth question here. Rolling, rolling right into this one. We have a seven-year-old woman that's going to present to clinic with a complaint of shortness of breath upon walking a few steps. These symptoms have been present for more than a year, but they've been stable. She denies any chest pain or shortness of breath when lying down, but has a chronic productive cough. On past medical history is significant for diabetes and hypertension. She was hospitalized twice in the past year for acute exacerbations of breathlessness. Um, her Last hospitalization, she was discharged taking furosemide, lisinopril, salmeterol, teotropium, as well as albuterol. Uh, at her last clinic visit one month ago, inhaled fluticasone and supplemental oxygen were added to her regimen. She has a 50-pack year smoking history, but was successfully able to quit smoking one year ago. Um, her blood pressure is 138 over 71. Her pulse is 89. Respiratory rate is 19. Her temperature is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Oxygen saturation is 87% on room air. Physical exam reveals minimal pedal edema or peripheral edema. Sorry about that. Auscultation of the lungs reveals bilateral wheezing, diminished breath sounds, and prolonged expiratory phase. Cardiac exam reveals a palpable P2 and a holosystolic murmur at the left lower sternal border. EKG shows right axis deviation, and echocardiography is suggestive of pulmonary hypertension with signs of right ventricular failure. Um, and then we get into the, the lead-in or the question itself, which says, which of the following agents in this patient's current regimen has been shown to decrease overall mortality in this patient population? And our answer choices are A, inhaled glucocorticoids, B, lisinopril, C, salmeterol, D, supplemental oxygen, or E, theophyll. 
All right, so go ahead and scan through the, the case and scan through the question and answer and lock down on an answer. And uh, I'll open a poll in about 10, 15 seconds after you guys have uh, had a chance to take a look. One thing for orientation, just FYI, just you know, just so you know, we, we just we, we are using a step two CK question. Uh, some folks have asked about it, so uh, you know, this is a bit of shift. So uh, just FYI. All right, so let's go ahead and open up the poll. Is it A inhaled uh, steroids, uh, B lisinopril, C salmeterol, uh, D supplemental oxygen? or E theophylline. So uh, looks like around 20% have answered. So we're gonna wait for another 15 seconds or so so, so we can get uh, an adequate sample size here. All right, looks like 40% of you guys have answered. We're about to hit 50%. percent 60%. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay, close to 70% of you folks have answered. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close the poll and uh, share the results. All right, so uh, it looks like you folks are favoring lysimeral B. A fair amount of you folks are also, uh, about 20% are thinking supplemental oxygen and, uh, and, and almost an equal number are thinking inhaled steroids. So let's, uh, Let's uh, close the poll, get back to the question. And the answer here is supplemental oxygen. All right, let's go back to this case. Let's talk about what's going on here and uh, why, why the answer was supplemental oxygen. All right, so for this question, I, I kind of I knew, I figured it might be a little more difficult. Um, so I wanted to walk through it kind of like, like how I, I said at the beginning, how I approach board style questions, just so we could kind of get a sense of another question um that uh you know might show up as well so um once again i would look at the the lead in which is the question itself it says which of the agents in this patient's current regimen um has been shown to decrease overall mortality in this patient population so we're looking at a mortality decreasing medicine we're looking for a medicine that decreases mortality and if you don't know those medicines off the top of your head i do suggest you go learn every medicine that decreases mortality uh, most of those medicines seem to be cardiac cardiac in nature um, but once again, just go learning all of your, your medicines that decrease mortality. So now if we look at our answer choices, um, if you don't know this, then, then it would make it very difficult, but only two of the treatment options here, two of the five, um, do decrease mortality. Um, that would be lisinopril and that would be supplemental oxygen. So those are the only two out of these available choices that decrease mortality. So if you just knew that fact alone, you've got it down to a 50, 50 shot. And, you know, now we get to basically say, you know, why, why would I pick B over D or what, what would lead to me picking one over the other? Um, so if we were to, once again, just kind of ratchet through each of the answer choices. So inhaled glucocorticoids, um, they're used in COPD as well as asthma. Classically, asthma is the where you use your inhaled glucocorticoids. Um, remember any of your persistent treatments um, for asthma, you know, you have mild, moderate, and severe um, persistent asthma. That's where your inhaled glucocorticoids are all used. Um, once again, they decrease symptoms, decrease exacerbations, decrease hospitalizations, um, but per se don't decrease mortality here. Um, lisinopril does decrease mortality, but it does it in a specific patient population. And that's patient with patients with congestive heart failure due to left heart dysfunction. So left-sided dysfunction, not right-sided dysfunction. So left-sided dysfunction here um, with EFs less than 45%. So ejection fractions less than 45% on you know left-sided heart dysfunction not right-sided so left-sided here um so heart failure you know there that that's where they decrease mortality um salmeterol you know it's a long-acting beta agonist once again can be used in copd as well as asthma um decreases hospitalizations exacerbations you know symptoms breathlessness but does not decrease mortality um so that one can't be a right answer again as well supplemental oxygen it does decrease mortality when worn you know greater than 15 to 18 hours a day in patients that are, you know, classically hypoxic at rest, um, as well as a few other um, clinical indications, and we'll get into those in just a second. And then theophylline, you know, theophylline is used um, 
has been used in asthma and also has been used in COPD, but you know, it's just basically kind of a caffeine derivative, um, classically not used in the United States unless you just cannot afford anything else. Um, so it would probably be the most wrong answer of the answer choices, just because it's a it's a, a dirty drug with a lot of side effects. Um, and usually when it we usually when you see theophylline on a board question for the USMLE, um, it is given as a wrong answer and a distractor. Um, so I would say, you know, if you ever see theophylline, it's the wrong answer unless they're asking you a mechanism of action question. Um, that's the only scenario that I could see that theophylline would be the right answer. So now we go into the stem itself. And we see that we have our 70 year old lady that she's complaining of shortness of breath. Um, symptoms have been there for a year. She denies any chest pain or shortness of breath when lying down. So she, she denies shortness of breath when lying down. That is orthopnea. So she's den denying orthopnea, but she does admit to a chronic productive cough. So we have no orthopnea, which would argue against this being congestive heart failure. Um, and once again, left sided dysfunction, congestive heart failure. Um, so no orthopnea there. So past medication from diabetes and hypertension, um, hospitalized twice in the past year for acute exacerbations of breathlessness. So what do we think that was? Um, looking at her smoking history, looking at her age, looking at her other, other physical exam findings, these were two acute exacerbations of COPD. So she was admitted twice in the last year for COPD exacerbations. Um, when we start looking at her meds, she's on furosemide. So um, you know, on a diuretic, uh, which would kind of make you think maybe this is congestive heart failure, but once again, we have um, you know, the no shortness of breath when lying down. Um, that, that argues against congestive heart failure. Then we have lisinopril, somatorol, teotropium, and albuterol. Um, once again, all those medicines, the somatorol, um, teotropium, and albuterol are all used in COPD. Um, one month ago, she saw her doc and she was put on fluticasone, which is also used in COPD, as well as supplemental oxygen. So put it on the supplemental oxygen, you, you know, likely due to chronic hypoxia, which we gain when we read a little further along, um, you know, with that O2 side of 87% on room air. Um, <clears throat> and then once again, you know, what are our risk factors for our potential diagnosis or disease that we're trying to, trying to drive home here, which again is COPD, admitted for the breathlessness, once again, no orthopnea, which would argue against CHF. She's been a long-term smoker. And then when we get into the physical exam findings, minimal pedal edema. So really bad COPD, particularly whenever you get to the point that you need to be on oxygen, leads to right heart dysfunction and core pulling out. So what is core pulling out? It's just right heart failure, secondary to lung disease. Um, and when you see that, once again, that right heart failure, can lead to some peripheral edema, as well as if you got an EKG, you would actually see the, you know, the right axis deviation. Um, and if you got an echo, you would see pulmonary hypertension and signs of right ventricular failure. So all of that is due to her bad lung disease. It's not due to, you know, cardiac disease itself. Um, she might have some cardiac disease if you look at, you know, her past medical history with smoking and hypertension and diabetes. Um, but what we're seeing on her echo, on her EKG, on her physical exam, is all due to her COPD. So if you take all that into account, basically everything in the stem is leading to COPD. COPD is the thing that we're trying to decrease the mortality in this patient population. So that makes supplemental oxygen our right answer here. Um, another way to kind of go about this would be to go through the stem itself and say, okay, the two diagnoses I'm debating here are CHF and COPD. Um, how many of the factors within the stem could I say account or accounted by or accounted for by being COPD? And then how many are accounted for by being CHF? And you just almost kind of form like a little tally system. So, you know, if you said, well, she's been short of breath of walking, that could be CHF or COPD. So they would both get a mark there. Um, she denies the shortness of breath when, when um, lying down. So that would be a mark against CHF. Um, she's admitted for these acute exacerbations of breathlessness, that'd be COPD. So that's two marks there. Um, that smoking history would be a mark for COPD. The peripheral edema, you could say maybe it was a mark for CHF and COPD, um, knowing that it can cause the corporal now. The oxygen would be another one for COPD. The cardiac findings, if you weren't sure what the palpable P2 or the holosystolic murmur meant, you could basically say, I'm just not going to count it for either or. Um, but once again, that palpable P2 is secondary to your pulmonary hypertension. Um, the murmur that we're hearing here is tricuspid regurge, which is also associated with her pulmonary hypertension, which is again all due to her lung disease. Um, so those would actually both be marked for COPD again. The pulmonary hypertension as well as the right ventricular failure are also marked for COPD. So if we were to kind of do it in tallies, 
we would see that CHF gets two or three marks while COPD gets seven or eight. So COPD is going to be our underlying diagnosis that we're trying to make there. And then we want to decrease the mortality in that patient population. Supplemental oxygen is what you use in anyone that has a, a resting SpO2 um, less than 88% or a PaO2 on an ABG less than 55%. It can be less than 89% if they have signs of right heart dysfunction or right heart failure, which this patient has, which is you know pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonale, signs of right heart failure. Um, also, if someone is exercising and they desaturate, um, there's some evidence to say that they need to be on oxygen as well. So supplemental oxygen will be your right answer here. All right, great, fantastic. So, uh, so at this point, Daniel, let's go ahead and uh, you know sum up you know the the question dissection strategies. Yes, yes. So um, once again, my my number one tip for you is to just have an approach when you uh, have a, you know working or approaching board style questions. Um, once again, to kind of tie it back into that chest X-ray, um, you know, as you have an approach when you read chest X-rays, have an approach when you work board style questions. Keep in mind that there is a format. Um, you know, with the stem, which is, you know, just the body of the, the question itself, the lead in or the question, the key, which is the correct answer, and then the distractors, which are the incorrect answers. Um, when you're selecting an answer, try to utilize all the information that they're providing you. Um, remember, even looking at your answer choices themselves can kind of help pull you toward or against, um, you know, particular diagnoses. Uh, and then each question is created to test a, a set of related topics and content areas. Meaning that if you know if you get to the end of the question, you're not really sure what they're talking about, you're not sure where to go, just kind of step back and say, okay, someone wrote this question, what do I think they're trying to test? Or what do I think they're trying to get at? Or where do I think they're trying to drive this, this stem and this question? Um, and try to help that to you know guide you on your answer choice selection. Yeah, and I'll just add that that sometimes, you know, typically, you know, the, on the US MLA, the majority of the time it's gonna be two concepts, occasionally be three concepts. Uh, you know, so you're, you're so you, you know, uh, you're looking for questions where, you know, the telltale, of course, is that you're given a clinical case and it's not in the, the lead is not asking about the diagnosis. It may be asking about the underlying pathophysiology, the mechanism of disease or, you know, the most likely treatment or so forth. Then you recognize that you're, you're dealing with a multi-step question and you're looking for multiple concepts that are being hooked together. All right. And so, you know, I'll, I'll just add, you know, it, you know, some of you folks might have seen my other talk, the Pastor 250, and so you may be forgive, for, uh, familiar with some of this advice. Uh, but just, but for those of you who, have, who haven't seen that talk, you know, there's, there's, you know, stepping back, there's some general advice that I think, uh, you know, is helpful for anybody preparing for the exam beyond dissecting a question. One is, you know, when you, uh, when you sit down to prepare for the exam, the, the majority of folks are, you know, um, and, you know, at least on, on, on the last webinar I did, you know, are, are, are you know, aren't going to be taking the exam till the summer. And so you've got several months to prepare for the exam. So, you know, once you, once you make a decision about what type of score you want uh, um, and, uh, um, and, you know, have some sense of what your baseline is and talk to your classmates and folks who have taken the exams or your advisors, you know, if, if your medical school you know, provides uh, some of that type of counseling, once you establish a schedule, you should be able to stick with it. As long as it's properly constructed, and as long as you don't, you know, do a couple other things like, you know, over schedule. So, you know, like like this, you want to make sure that uh, uh, that it's it's you know it, it's well set up. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I've seen some of my classmates or other med students. You know, they'll change their 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 uh, their their schedule in the middle, and uh, um, and and you know because they they they, they fear that they're uh, um, you know they're they're not preparing in a particular area, but Usually what happens is if they shift their schedule so they can focus on another area, that means they have to give up something. And sometimes you don't know exactly what you're giving up. So at the end of the day, it tends to be a wash. Uh, you know, the, the, the second piece of advice that uh, students often talk about is uh, integrate and apply everything. So, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, the idea here is that, you know, as we just talked about, the majority of the questions are going to have more than one step. Uh, and so it, it, you know, it comes down to integration of related concepts, just as Daniel said, you have to figure out what, you know, what, what is that path that they're trying to get you to go down through and then, uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, solve, solve the, uh, the case from that uh, perspective. Uh, um, when we talk about preparing for the exam, 
there are some subjects uh, uh, such as uh, biochemistry, uh, micropharmacology uh, that tends to be quote unquote a little more crammable. Now, while we don't we don't recommend that you cram, we we recommend that you really study you know uh, uh, diligent and consistently over time. Uh, you know to to really learn the concepts. Uh, you know because at the end of the day, it's all about application as opposed to rote recall. Uh, that being said, sometimes you know. Uh, especially towards the end, you know, certain crammable subject areas like, you know, uh, you know, metabolic, you know, metabolic pathways, you know, drug tables, uh, uh, bug, bug tables tend to be a little easier to study, you know, i.e. crammable because they're well structured and the, the, uh, uh, the, the types of concepts are, are repetitive, like, you know, for, for, for bugs, for example, right? It's, you know, uh, how do you make the laboratory diagnosis? How do you, uh, you know, uh, you know how, you know, you know, where do they spread? What's the treatment? Uh, you know, uh, you know, what are the vectors? What are the reservoirs? Those are the things that come up all the time. If it's drugs, it's what's the mechanism of action? What's the treatment indications? What are the side effects? What are the drug-drug interactions? So they, they, you know, so the U.S. only tends to attack those same areas, and so that's why they tend to be those areas tend to be a, a bit more uh, crammable. Uh, focusing on high yield material. Uh, so and, and previously learned material. So the key thing here is actually the previously learned material that's actually high yield. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the key point here is that as you know, hopefully you've had an adequate, you know, medical school uh, education, and they should be covering a lot of the stuff that actually shows up on the exam. So your your job initially is to actually focus in those areas uh, that you previously learned that's high yield, you know, that's corroborated by high yield texts such as first aid, and, Pathomas and other other texts out there. As I mentioned, if you if you don't uh, if you if you are uh, wise and not over scheduling, uh, realizing that you're you're not a robot that you can't do this uh, 14 hours a day for you know two months during your dedicated time, or even if you're an IMG and you graduate and you're you know, you've got you know more time or or you're doing this you know uh, between work and this and the other and you've got you're doing it over several months, you got to recognize that. You can only do so much. You got to make sure that there are breaks in there so you can take care of yourself, your fam, your your friend, your your maintain your your relationships, your friendships, your family, and so forth. Um, the other thing you need to watch out for is burnout, right? And so it's easy to burn out, and so that means you got to pace yourself. Uh, you, uh, if you're taking CBSSA, make sure you're uh, you're you're continuing to rise and and, and not peak too early. Uh, and, you know, related to that, staying relaxed and grounded, that's something that we spend a lot of time talking about in section one of first aid for the U.S. only step one. Uh, and so you, you, you got to be deliberate about planning your preparation for the U.S. only. We have a checklist in the front of the book uh, right, right before section one and after all the, you know, the, 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 the thank yous and the acknowledgments and so forth. That'll, you know, you know kind of walk you through step by step how you might want to prepare for the exam. All right. So, you know, uh, we covered quite a bit in the hour and I know we're a little over. So there's a bunch of places to get a hold of us. Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you know, do follow us, like us, uh, get out there. Uh, and, you know, uh, and we have a, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, free resources there like uh, digital flashcards. We, you know, on, that we'll tweet at you on, uh, on, uh, if you follow us on Twitter, uh, you know, uh, questions on Facebook. Uh, and also on our blog at firstaidteam.com uh, as well, too. Uh, 